going to pass over to uh, Kenton Ross from NASA to do the introductions. Hi, thanks, Esther. Um, so welcome to the webinar today about uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, um, we're happy to have you and uh, eager to share a packed program with you. Um, so at this point, I think we can go ahead and bring up uh, my presentation uh, with the CIOS and WGCAPD content. There we go, thanks everybody. So CIOS for any of you that might not be aware is the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites and uh, it ensures international coordination of civil space uh, based earth observation programs. And so it in, in involves space agencies as well as agencies that are engaged in space in some form or fashion. Uh, there are 62, mem uh, 62 agencies involved, 34 of them full members and 28 associate members. And they're operating a total of 170 satellites. Uh, they're looking down on us. Uh, and it coordinates and harmonizes earth observations to make it easier for uh, the user community to access and use that data. And um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and step forward here in the interest of time. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a specific working group. That's one of the two working groups sponsoring this uh, uh, webinar. Um, that is uh, one of the working groups that's part of CIOS. And that's the working group on capacity building and data democracy. Um, so that working group, sometimes called WGCAPD, um, it, their mission is to increase the capacity of institutions in emerging, emerging economies for effective use of Earth observation data for the benefit of society and to achieve sustainable development. And the interest of WGCAPD in today's webinar is that Jupyter Notebooks uh, serves as an excellent tool for uh, capacity development. Um, and so uh, we're very eager to uh, share this content. Um, WGCAPD um, has many different activities, virtual trainings, webinars, and MOOCs, uh, as well as in-person workshops that in involve training about earth observations, thematic training about different applications that can be done with earth observations, as well as regional workshops focused on regional issues. Um, there are many resources available to you from WGCAPD, uh, including the training calendar, the WGCAPD uh, resources webpage, and uh, various distribution lists that might be applicable to different activities. Um, and with that, I think that's it. And I will stop sharing my screen. And we can segue to our next speaker. Our next speaker, if I bring up my notes, is Yusuke Ikehata from JAXA, and he's going to be introducing the second CIOS working group that's sponsoring this webinar, uh, the Working Group for Information Systems and Services. Uh, Yusuke? Okay, thank you for introducing me. So, wait a moment. And can you see my speech uh, desktop? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so how? Let me just start by introducing myself. My name is Yosuke Kata from Sales Bridges team. And I'm in charge of technology exploration interest group. And, uh, so we already, uh, Los Kentos already so show this, but I'll uh, show this structure again. This is a subsidiary body supporting sales. Bridges promote, um, promotes collaboration in the development of systems and services that manage and supply observation data. Bridges creates and develop, demonstrates prototypes supporting sales and geo requirements. And Bridges also address the internal, internal management of EO data the creation of information systems and the delivery of interoperable services. The activities and 
expertise of Regis span the full range of the information life cycle from the requirements and the metadata definition for the initial ingest ingestion of satellite data into archives through to the incorporation of derived information into end user applications. And we also have four interest group and I'll introduce them. First is data preservation and the stewardship interest group. This interest group works for enable the sharing of agency investigation developments expertise and lessons learned relating EO data stewardships. Second is the discovery and access interest group. This group provides three services. The International Directory Cell Network, IDN, is sales master directory. It provides, uh, it provides access to information on scientific data sets in the earth science for free. And Quick and Fedio is also provides catalogs and we can search and obtain metadata from them. Third is interoperability and use interest group. This group investigates some portals and systems which cross-cutting satellites and sensors. And now we focus the, focus the future data architecture. Some of the systems will be used in the, today's topics. The last interest group is technology exploration group. We serve as a forum for exchange of technology information and lessons learned experiences about current and trending software technologies, services, and other internet, internet related software technologies, and promote technology in sales that provide, prove beneficial to the as observation community. So by this context, we work with WGAPD and SEO. And we also research these Jupyter notebook experiences. In Regis 49, we hold sessions for Jupyter notebook. And in Regis 50, Esther summarized survey, survey results and talk about developing a best practice for Jupyter Notebook. We hope that Jupyter Notebook provides useful and powerful interfaces for analyzing satellite data. And thank you for finish. Thank you, Yusuke. Okay, with that, we will now turn to our demonstrations. And the first demonstrator up will be Esther Conway. Uh, from the National Center of Earth Observation, or NCO, and uh, she's representing the UK Space Agency, and she'll be demonstrating exploratory use of Jupyter Notebooks with UK's Jasmine Notebook Service. Esther? Okay. Right. Um, so can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Okay, yes. excellent. Okay, so in this uh, first um, 20 minute slot, um, I, I would like to be able to give a quick summary of why this conversation started uh, within um, CIOS and why we think Jupyter Notebooks uh, are a very useful thing uh, for capacity development. Um, so for some beginners that you might have attending the webinar, the basic summary of a Jupyter Notebook is that it is software that allows you to combine rich documentation um, to embed code. It's normally Python, but Jupyter Notebooks do in reality uh, support over 40 different uh, program languages and um, help you to be able to produce um, data visualizations. 
and they run in a number of different forms. And what we were seeing within the CEOs Quickest group is that people were beginning to use Jupyter Notebooks in all sorts of different ways. Initially, whenever we at CEDA um, started working with Jupyter Notebooks, we were really just capturing them at the end of projects so that you could download them, run them locally on your machines so that you could interact with some of the data holdings that we had within the CEDA archive. At the same time, we were beginning to see more and more Jupyter Notebook um, activity happening within university departments where more and more data science class and, and basic programming skills for Earth observation were beginning to be taught through the Jupyter Notebook um, technology. And um, more recently, and this is where we think there might be a real um, sea change in how people are able to interact with our data holdings, is that we're able to deploy something called um, Jupyter Hub Services next to um, very big Earth observation and environmental data. <laughs> archives and then whenever we get to the words the end of this uh, webinar we'll be able to see um, how you're able to do some very very sophisticated very powerful things driven by Jupyter notebooks uh, whether it be with Google Earth Engine or things such as um, the um, ESA PGGS uh, data cube. So to begin with why is this important for capacity development? Um, in one way, it really helps you to be able to deal with big data, which is very much the case for Earth observation satellite data. Uh, whenever we um, launched our Jupyter Notebook service against the CEDA archive, that meant that you're immediately able to have access to over 20 petabytes of data. Um, just over a very basic internet connection. And whenever we move to look at things like Google Earth Engine, it's, it's a a whole different um, order of magnitude, the, the scale and the volume of data. So 20 petabytes of data that equ equates to tens of thousands of laptops. So you couldn't be able to begin to hold um, those data collections um, locally. You need centralized services to be able to do that. Um, in terms of velocity, because you can push an awful lot of the data processing um, up onto the central archive and some of the big computers that we have there. That means that you could be sitting in, in Jakarta, in Nairobi, and begin to be able to access some very powerful um, data processing capabilities. And whenever Matt Padgett talks at the end of the webinar with his demonstration, um, he'll be able to explain just how powerful that is beginning um, to get. Um, veracity, um, it's a way of guaranteeing the quality um, of the data that you can have access to, um, because this has obviously been validated by us before it goes into the archive. It has appropriate metadata information that helps you to be able to use it. And then uh, on the flip side of volume is also um, the degree of heterogeneity, the number of different types of data sets that you can have access to. So for us in the UK on the CEDA archive, that's earth observation data, that's atmospheric data, that's climate data, that's ground-based data. And uh, we've got nearly 8,000 different data sets that you can have access to via the Jupyter um, Hub service. And then the, the final V that we always talk about in um, big data science is uh, value. Uh, so once you're able to develop um, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, we're going to look at um, the ability to be able to create um, services so that you can begin to deliver the information that you need from the data that we hold. And uh, one of the things that we're doing for, doing on this webinar is exploring that arc right the way up to some simple examples that I will be going through to some very complex um, capabilities indeed. So for the entry point people, probably one of the most important thing is that this lowers barrier, barriers to use and supports the development of data science skills. So maybe 10 years ago where we were going into different departments and organizations, people would need to download the data. You might be start starting them off with a terminal window, some basic um, Python notebooks, and it would probably take a couple of days of uncertainty before you were able to produce um, decent results. By providing people with Jupyter notebooks, you're able to give a much better entry point and um, interaction with the data itself. 
Um, there's an awful lot of really good support material um, out there. So one of the things that we can do with some of our notebooks that we'll be looking at is how we're linking to the catalog records um, from the data so that you can understand who produced it, how it was produced, what the variables are, uh, papers associated with it, all sorts of good quality information. You have a lot of very good um, online tutorials, which again, we'll be looking at how we can link from the documentation within a notebook to support people changing how they visualize the data. Uh, one thing a lot of us have been using is the software Carpentry uh, tool. Um, where we've been using those resources and I know that in the UK one of the things that we're currently doing is porting um, some of those lessons that we've traditionally taught into the Jupyter Notebook form so that it's much easier for users um, to be able to train and of course during these pandemic years to be able to do good quality online training uh, like that um, is proving to be an invaluable and again there's lots of notebooks out here the one that I picked out even though it's a little bit on the old side is is the Lin book on Python programming and again um, these resources um, everything that I've got up here are all completely free and open to people to use so again it's the idea of being able to uh, allow users to be able to maintain meaningful results quickly so this is just a, a quick snapshot um, of the uh, SST plot that we're going to look at now. And again, there's some information on our services here. And one of the things that we've done is that we've put together um, GitHub repository so that if you're to click on that, you can go look at that notebook in greater depth uh, and see how that works. But I'm just going to um, drop out of my presentation quickly and show you again, for those of you that are not particularly familiar uh, with Jupyter Notebooks, what this actually looks like. Um, so what I would do is that I would just put a URL into my browser. We do two-factor authentication. So I get challenged for a username and password, and that will take me directly into my home area. And I can very simply um, clone um, a GitHub um, registry and download a whole load of different um, notebooks. Uh, we're developing something called databooks to match up with the holdings that we've got in our archive. Um, so here we can see very simply, um, we can use the simple ls command and by clicking play, and again, we don't have time to run these um, directly because we've got limited time on this webinar. It allows me to browse through the 20 petabytes of data that we currently have in our archive. We can take people through importing net CDF libraries so that, and, uh, so that you can read in the data, how you can read in different arrays of data. And um, here, for example, we're using something called Carthy um, so that the data is displayed on a map so that human beings can actually interpret what it is. So this is the uh, very simple plot that you can just run so that you can immediately get, get a global view of the data. But uh, this is a capacity development webinar. So what can you actually do um, to support capacity development. Well, in this example, we can take the same code and we can give people advice and link it into various different tutorials. So for example, this is an online tutorial on Cartopy projection. And we can give the very simple example where, of course, the center of your world may not be Europe, it may be somewhere else. So we can very easily by just changing a little bit of the code switched projection. We can also go into um, different uh, resources such as, yeah, I'm just going to try to move this. Um, so this is uh, the matplotlib tutorial. So one of the most important things that you can do when you visualize your data is to get good control of color scales. So you can link straight through to really good resources that explain different color scales. Um, we have got articles in here about how to deal with things such as color blindness and about the importance of being able to visualize the data correctly. And of course, this is important because whenever you're dealing with something like sea surface temperature, um, the color that, that you're looking for to represent where color, color bleaching of coral reefs um, 
would occur might be different from why you're investigating the decline in salmon populations around Scotland. So again, we can link into all sorts of tutorials and um, new learners um, of this information can really have um, a lot of fun playing around and understanding the importance of uh, colour scales and different uh, projections that are available to them. So I'm go just going to pop back into my presentation again. And again, all, all of these materials should be open to you. The other thing that we're currently doing within um, the CEOS Wigus group, and again, we'd love to get um, wider input into this, is uh, developing a best practice so that um, data producers, authors of Jupyter Notebooks, providers of EO data, um, data archives and, and those of us that are providing um, data analysis infrastructure can produce notebooks in the best way um, because you do need to look at various different issues to make sure that these notebooks are really reusable and can become a research asset for other people uh, because at the moment what we're seeing is an archive are all of these data producers um, producing data and invariably they I, I would say probably between 70 and 80 percent of the time someone has produced a really nice notebook um, but it can break down for all sorts of different reasons and we need to look at that uh, so we need to be able to encourage good structure, workflow, documentation within it, so that can be uh, reusable past the person that's just doing the demo at the end of the projects, because very often they have the best knowledge um, regarding getting key information out of those data sets. We need to look at things such as languages, different versions. So one of the principal reasons that notebooks begin to break down is that no one's actually specified the, the version of Python that they have written uh, the notebook in. Um, libraries, uh, we've got plenty of examples where people have given us the notebook, but they've been using a, a module out of a different Python file, and that isn't given to us. Um, about how we begin to rerun on different virtual machines and platforms. Um, how we begin to link some of this data up um, to data cubes. And again, we're going to have some very powerful demonstrations later on regarding that. And again, how we begin to port maybe some of these notebooks between uh, the different platforms that we're developing. Again, we have Jasmine in the UK, but there are lots of very different domain specific um, archives all over the world that are now launching Jupyter Hub services uh, next to their data sets. And something that we think will probably be very interesting for uh, the capacity development um, community is that ability um, to be able to use something like Binder. So obviously for the very big data sets, it makes sense to use um, centralized services. However, uh, within Jasmine, we hold a lot of um, smaller, more specialist data sets, and it would become possible for that to be ported to more local and regional um, locations and to set up things such as Binder services to be able to encourage people on that local and regional level to be able to use those data sets as well. So it's capacity development for uh, infrastructure as well as just using um, some of that data. Okay, so I'm just going to stop here um, with, with this section. And um, I don't know if we've, we've got any questions at this point, Lauren. Um, one says, could you please copy the link in the chat, please? Uh, if, if you want access to the presentations and the notebooks, uh, you should have received an email that has a link to the event page. And uh, you'll see I, I've put links to both the notebook repositories and to the presentations. Um, are currently up on that. And then at a later point, we'll be putting uh, both uh, the recorded webinar and these materials up on the CEOS website uh, for people to have a look at in the future. And Esther, we have another question. Um, it says, if I understand correctly, the processing via Jupyter is run on a server machine that belongs to UK's data analysis facility. Also, what about Python libraries? Can we install our own? Thank you. 
Um, I'll be getting into that in more detail. So um, depending on the data analysis platform that you're looking at, this has been configured in different ways, but uh, whenever you log on to our Jupyter Hub service, you have the ability to use something called our JASPY scientific analysis machines, or you can set up your own environment. And another question, are animated maps in the notebooks? Um, it, it depends on the notebook and its dependencies. So again, okay. it, 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 yeah, it, it, it depends what somebody wants to, and, and this again would be a good example for us to look at uh, within the best practice, what will run and what uh, we can easily uh, port between different environments and what are the pitfalls that we need to be aware of to make sure these uh, assets are reusable. And then one last question, uh, how useful is the Jupyter Notebook for software development activities? So could you just repeat that? Oh, sure. So um, how useful is the Jupyter Notebook for software development activities? Uh, we think it's particularly um, useful for co-development um, type activities so that we do have a lot of users within the UK working on shared data and shared projects. They want to be able to quickly visualize the data and um, show that and uh, share that uh, with each other. And um, again, we're working on some really big projects at the minute um, for Digital Twin Earth. So to be able to demonstrate, um, at least on the climate explorer side, um, the types of things that, that we're doing and to get uh, feedback and input uh, from potential users of the data is, is something that's very important and is facilitated by Jupyter Notebooks. And one last question here. Um, have you ported the best practices for notebooks into a template for developers, or do you have a set of recommendations? Right, so, so what we were looking at, if I just go back in my slides, is the stage that we're currently at within um, CEOS is that we've sketched out a number of different um, topic areas. And there's a link here within the presentation uh, to what we think the discussions should be around this, this area. So hopefully in the next year to 18 months, we'll be able to flesh out and publish um, the first best practice um, document. But this is why we're trying to um, capture interested people through the post webinar survey. So if this is something um, that you'd like to contribute to, please do let us know so that we can contact you and get your input on that. Great, thank you, Esther, and that's all the questions. Okay. Okay, uh, Esther, thanks very much. That was really great and brought out a lot of important issues about use of Jupyter Notebooks with Earth observations. And uh, um, uh, I think it set the stage very well for our uh, upcoming demonstrations. Um, so let's, Esther, do you have something? Yeah, uh, so, so I was just going to go into the second slot, looking at more detail on Jupyter Notebooks on the data analysis platforms. Um, oh, we're, we're pretty close to time, uh, but just go ahead and jump in. Yeah, uh, okay, so so th this was the, the second of my 20 minute slot presentations. So the first one was the general intro, and we're, we're just doing uh, Jupyter Notebooks on data analysis platforms now where I was going okay. to get the specific yeah, example. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, so as I was saying earlier, we're seeing big evolutions in data archives. And, um, and this is a diagram of how our local services are evolving. And it's really only in the last two years that we've, um, that we've launched this uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, service. And just to give a little bit more information um, on CEDA, uh, we've got over 20 petabytes of data. We've got the uh, traditional catalog and data access um, services, but next to that, we've got our data analysis infrastructure. And part of that is um, the, uh, the notebook service that we've just launched. But next to that are also all of the really big um, 
group workspaces where people developing new data sets are storing that data. And we've also got high performance transfer machines so that you're not restricted to only the data that sits within the archive. It can be data that you're developing. It can be data that you need to bring in from other locations. And again, we've got over 40 petabytes of high performance um, storage to enable that. And I think this comes to the earlier question about the um, common uh, software installation that we've got on our common um, Jaspi um, machines that have got a standard deployment of matplotlib, of numpy, of Python, of X-Ray, um, but you also have the capability of building your own specific software environments to use. And what this has done is that it's presented us with a lot of different um, opportunities so that we can have webinars um, such as this. Uh, we're developing the best practice. And um, now whenever projects have developed uh, Jupyter Notebooks next to that, uh, we're trying to capture this within our data books repository uh, so that people can have instant access and visualizations of this data. Uh, we have different training events and associated materials. And um, also something that we're just going to look at now uh, would be the sorts of things that you can do within hackathons. So the first example um, I've got here, which formed the basis of um, a hackathon type activity uh, would be an area of common interest. So one of the big things, as we all know, that's happened over the last two years is the pandemic. And we've seen lockdowns occurring across um, various different um, cities. So I'm just going to leave this slide now and um, go quickly back into my notebooks. So what we can do is that we can again um, start off with a notebook. We can link it up to navigation tools. In this case, it's the Sentinel Data Hub that allows you to search um, petabytes of data so that you can locate for specific um, time periods and geographic locations um, for where uh, Sentinel 5P data um, in observation form uh, exists. And what you can do is identify the correct file. Um, here we have um, just using simple ls commands browsing through the library. Uh, we can uh, have a look at um, how we create the first basic plots. So again, this is just a plot one data file. Um, but then again, as we had in the last example, we can link this up to um, base map tutorials. And what we can do is that we can set bounding boxes so that you can zoom in on particular areas of interest. And again, you can begin playing around with color scales so that you can pull up the information that's of interest. So once you can teach people the basic skills um, in these areas, you can then go on to um, creating some more sophisticated um, notebooks and ones that are now become aimed at solving specific problems. So again, with the lockdown issue, we can look at the same regions, again, just reusing the code that you, that you have before. And again, this is our, our first global plot of the data, but then we can Right, in the wrong notebook. So this is in April, 1999, before the pandemic. And what you can see then, repeating the same process is that you can then do a comparison of what was happening exactly a year later. And you can use the annotation capabilities of your notebooks to record what the weather conditions, whether there were any public holidays. And you can begin to see some of the really important decreases in atmospheric pollution that happened within this time period. And we can then switch to different regions. Um, so this, for example, again, looking at different months, uh, we're looking at, at the China region. So this, again, their lockdowns began happening in January 2020. So comparing like for like, we can look at plots of China in uh, January uh, 1999. And then we can see really significant 
drop-offs of the data. So what this gives you the ability to is to set up um, teams all over the world that are interested in this sort of thing. And going back to my presentation, what I would recommend is um, people actually look at things that we've been doing over the past few months in the run up to COP26. So we're able to get teams from Ghana and Kenya um, to look at different clim climate changes in East and West in Africa, look at energy, look at different issues. And again, if you follow some of these links in the presentations, you could see some of the really good notebooks that have been produced by people. And then just on to uh, my final example. Uh, we've got uh, one of um, Kenyan biomass. So the previous one, we were looking at a global archive of data, um, something that you would want to log into centrally. Uh, but we also have examples here that we were running on Google Colabs. So that means this is something that can be hosted either with us on the archive or done locally itself. And again, just dipping very quickly back in, um, what this enables people to do is look at broad range of libraries, really beginning to build those data science skills, use modules, use functions, um, unzip and use data from uh, various different um, sources, work with shaped files, and then importantly, begin to train people to extract the information that they need um, from the satellite data sets itself. So I'm just again, there's a link here uh, to the GitHub repository where you can look at this as a notebook example in greater detail, but just quickly showing it to you. What we've got is we've got a central notebook and what we've got is um, this file, which contains an awful lot of different functions, which are reusable across multiple different um, data sets. But what we can see this data set doing is that immediately it takes care of an awful lot of different libraries which needs to be installed. So we can see the installation happening. So something like that would probably be daunting to people if they weren't initially using it in this type of notebook form. Uh, we can link up to various different um, software resources. We can read data directly in from the archive itself. And we can then begin to look at things such as uh, reprojecting data, what that means effectively working with different raster files creating plots from the data, and then uh, being able to work with statistics. So the important thing to realize about Jupyter Notebooks is, is that it's not all about um, visualizations. It can perform a lot of different um, functions for you. Um, and then the final, just move this. Let me show you. is how you can use it to produce uh, the um, CSV files. So it's just off screen at the moment. Um, so that you can read the critical information that you need from decision-making into Excel files. Okay, so just conscious of the time restrictions that we've got, I am going to try to pop back into the last couple of slides in my presentation. So the important thing about all of this is that it really does um, support collaborative working between teams of scientists internationally that are creating these data sets. And um, I really do recommend that you go to the catalog page and you read about um, some of this um, important data. So the data file that we were just looking at uh, was again produced using a Jupyter notebook. And that would be a, a, a very advanced case that we wouldn't go into today, but that uses um, forestry um, machine learning. 
um, algorithms, um, along with um, ground data um, sourced within um, Kenya and the Kenyan team and the University of Leicester NCO team work together to produce this data set and then that training notebook that we've just quickly had a look at so that we can deliver the right results and the key information again using shape files are uh, produced by um, a UN project so that we're delivering the right information um, to the right people. Okay, so with that, I'm just conscious of these time pressures, I'm going to stop there. If people do have further questions about that, please feel free to contact me on that email. Um, so I don't know if anything else has come up in the chat, Lauren. So Esther, there aren't any questions in the Q&A, but there is one um, talking about, and it kind of got answered, but uh, for those who've never opened a Jupyter Notebooks before, um, you know, does CIOS have a starting with Jupyter intro guide um, or any kind of guidance um, to help, you know, bring students, you know, into the, into, to um, begin? Okay, so, so this is the, very first, and, and again, um, Ken can probably answer some of this as well. Uh, this is the very first webinar that we've done, and we're giving in this one a very broad introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. But what we find is that what a lot of us are doing is that we've been using software carpentry as a basis, and we're creating the first basic beginner's notebooks to train people up um, on basic data science skills are using that. So if that's something that you feel is very important for your community, again, at the end, please do fill out that survey, leave us your details so that we know that you're a person to follow up uh, on, on this with. Um, Kenton, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, Esther, the only thing I would add is that the Jupyter Notebooks is, it's, really easy to use. And as long as you have some basic Python skills, um, it, it really, um, it, there's a very quick learning curve to figuring out how to apply it. So I think the Earth Observation community is jumping right in and using Jupyter Notebooks for different kinds of training activities, as we'll hear from our demonstrators and uh, also from our panelists. Um, and uh, so often the, their explanation of how to use it for their trainees is just a few minutes at the beginning of launching into an earth observations topic. Uh, how to use it more broadly for big data issues and things like that. Uh, I think we're really only at the beginning. So there, there are, a, a, as you're kind of describing from the CIA side, but I think from the community as a whole, uh, that's, that's at least my perspective, but I think from some of our other speakers, we may hear, hear more comments as well. And there's one last question now. Um, most of the work focuses on visualization via Jupyter Notebook, which is basically the equivalent of our studio. Uh, while visualization is a great thing for understanding data patterns, real problem tackling requires more sophisticated techniques. How far do you go into that? Could you just repeat that again? Sure, I think um, so I think the kind of general gist is is relating to our um, use. And so you know how useful is Jupyter notebooks with R instead of Python? And then also um, looking at kind of like uh, you know while visualization is a great thing for understanding data patterns, real problem tackling requires more sophisticated techniques. And so how far can Jupyter notebooks go in doing that? Okay, I think the best person to answer that question might be uh, Simone because he, he's been talking a lot about uh, the use of uh, different languages, but what Jupyter Notebooks can be used for is that they can drive um, a lot of different um, software um, in addition to what you can just contain within them locally uh, in Python. Um, but Simone, I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Uh so if I may comment on this and give my personal view that is also, uh, I would say, shared across different communities we came across. Uh, I think what the Jupyter Notebook uh, uh, is, is providing to the user is an environment where 
documentation and the live code uh, are uh, very close to the data. And uh, uh, we are not offering here also today in, the, in this uh, uh, meeting, uh, uh, let's say, a vetrina of all the capability we have. Uh, what I think we are uh, demonstrating for the capacity building is that if you don't find a solution for the analysis and the analytics you need with Jupyter, you do have the possibility to implement by yourself. Because uh, can we, uh, I saw other question, can we uh, uh, add extra packages to the environment? Sure, you can add uh, uh, an additional package to the, uh, to the Jupyter environment. So uh, it's an enabling environment uh, with uh, uh, the possibility to share across, uh, across community. So I think it's a visualization uh, for sure, uh, and uh, is also analytics uh, uh, at your fingertips. Okay, Esther, do you want to turn now to, to Brian's demonstration? Okay, yeah, I, I've stopped sharing my screen, so it should be ready for Brian now. So I'll uh, introduce you, Brian. Brian Kilo is from NASA, and he's with the CIOS's Systems Engineering Office. He's going to be demonstrating uh, the Open Data Cube Google Sandbox, which is very flexible and can be set up for many learners uh, for a lightweight introduction to using Jupyter Notebooks uh, with uh, Open Data Cube protocols. So Brian, over to you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna share with you an uh, Open Data Cube sandbox demonstration and it'll be getting into Jupyter Notebooks, touching earth observation data. So there was a, a recent question there in the chat and hopefully this will answer that. So I, I wanna give you a little intro, a little bit of background on what this thing is all about, how we developed this sandbox. I'm gonna do two demos for you in the end. One is on a Sentinel-2 cloud coverage demo. It's basically just a browsing of Sentinel-2 data. And then the second one is a deeper look at some Sentinel-1 radar applications. Uh, I'll, I'll bet that many of you have not used radar data before, and it's something uh, very interesting to take a look at, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. So I'm gonna show you an Open Data Cube sandbox. This sandbox runs on Google Colab. So Google Colab is a Jupyter Notebook environment that is run um, on the Google framework and Google Cloud. And we can connect to the Google Earth Engine data sets. So that's what we've done is we've put a, um, used the Google Colab environment and connected to the Earth Engine data sets on the background. This is really an ideal tool for doing small scale applications and it's ideal for training capacity building as well. So the core of all of this and what we're doing is the open data cube. Some of you may have heard about it, others may not, but this is a open source data management structure and analysis framework. So this is really the glue in the middle that connects the applications that we do with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, working with Earth's op Earth observation satellite data and connecting uh, those applications to the satellite data that you see all the way on the left. So we use Google Earth Engine data. Now, how do we do that in the middle? You can certainly go and use Google Earth Engine to do this. And there's a um, programming environment there that you can do JavaScript or, or Python scripting there. What we've done here is installed our open data cube infrastructure, which describes the data in a metadata index, and it has an API that talks to the Jupyter Notebooks uh, algorithms. And this core code is being used around the world in a number of places. So it all started in Australia, where uh, the Australians had a geoscience data cube there. Then a number of us in the CIOS organization, several agencies came together, and we said, let's globalize this and use it in other places. Since that time, we've been using it in Africa. It's operational for continental scale Africa. It's called Digital Earth Africa. We're talking with the Pacific Islands now to do something similar and with the Americas as well. It's being used in over hundred countries around the world. So the Open Data Cube is a common way 
to connect to the data and it allows us to share algorithms across platforms. And it doesn't matter whether you're using someone else's cloud, you know, cloud XYZ, doesn't really matter where it is, but using this common framework and a way to describe the data, we can share algorithms very easily. It's the Jupyter notebooks, which are on the very top of all of this. And that's how we interact with the data. So our goal is to ultimately have a network of these interconnected regional cubes around the world. And we hope to grow that user community to use this. So let's talk about the Open Data Cube sandbox. So my office, the CIOS Systems Engineering Office, we developed this sandbox and it runs on CoLab. Here's where you go and find it, openearthalliance.org slash sandbox. I'll repeat that at the end here of the presentation, but that's where you can find it, openearthalliance.org slash sandbox. There's a description of everything I'm going to share with you here today. It's free and open. And it's a Jupyter Notebook interface, again, connected to the Earth Engine data sets. You can run these analyses anywhere in the world. There are some limitations, and I'll, I'll share them with you in a moment. There's only two things that you need. You need a Google account. Many of you have a Gmail, but it, it requires a Google account. Easy to sign up. It's on that website. And you also need to be authorized, be an Earth Engine authorized user, because it makes an authorization call um, to allow you to, to get at the data. Once you connect all of that, you can start to run. So we have currently linked to four data sets, Landsat, Sentinel-2, both are optical, big global data sets, very popular, Sentinel-1, the radar, and VIRS, which is night lights, which is also a very interesting looking product, you know, looking at um, satellite data at night as you pass over the earth, looking at the lights. This is the list of the applications that you'll find when you go there. Everything from cloud statistics to browse, creating cloud filtered mosaics, looking at water extent, spectral products, land change and, and phenology, which is the growth and um, Sentinel-1 radar data, coincidences and Beers nightlights. And so this is just an example of what some of these products look like, um, just, just some visual output um, you can see in the middle, top middle here is the water observation from space. This is the time series look at water. On the bottom is Veer's night lights. This is actually a city, uh, Kumasi, Ghana. In the bottom left is a way to search for coincidences of these satellites. For example, when does Landsat and Sentinel-2 go over the same spot on the Earth on the same day? It, it, it can be very valuable for doing uh, interoperable data searches when I want to use both of these missions and I want to uh, validate them. And there's also these things called triple coincidences, which are extremely rare. Uh, the top right is a phenology curve, looking at some agriculture. The grayscale image is a radar. What's really amazing about uh, radar is you'd never have to worry about clouds. So all these issues we deal with on Landsat and Sentinel-2 every day uh, are not present in the Sentinel-1 radar data. So these are just some quick examples. So a few comments before I show you the demo. The CoLab environment is limited to approximately 12 gigabytes of RAM. So what that basically means is I can only load a limited number of pixels or data into my Jupyter Notebook uh, environment in order to run an analysis. Then there's some storage capability. So if you want to store products or results, that uh, gives you quite a bit of that. So basically this 12 gigabyte of RAM gives you small analyses. Now I say small, it's act, they're actually reasonable size and I'll show you in the demo that's something on the order of maybe a half degree latitude longitude, a stack of many years, depends on the analysis. But as you run larger analysis, what will happen is it will, it will come to a screeching halt or it just won't finish. So one interesting thing that you can do is you can save your notebook modifications in Google Drive or on GitHub. So you can take the templates that we provided, modify them, save them on your Google Drive and use them later, which is exactly a demo I'm gonna show you today where I took a notebook, modified it, made it more precise and interesting for an application I was working on, and then I use it later. We've also created a user forum. If you've got any questions, if you run into this uh, and wanna know more, have some questions about the notebooks we have or wanna maybe uh, put something else up there, uh, develop, uh, check out our forum, forum.openearthalliance.org. We'd love to hear your feedback and your questions. So 
Time now to look at some demos. Uh, just as a reminder, openearthalliance.org slash sandbox is where you can find this tool. The user forum is at the Open Earth Alliance. If you want to see more about the Open Data Cube, go to opendatacube.org. Okay, so I'm now going to go back to, let me get this right. Um, I'm now going to show you the uh, what this all looks like when you go to the website. So here we are at the, make sure my timing is okay here. We're at the website. So openearthalliance.org slash sandbox has got all the information that you need to know about how to run one of these notebooks, how to open up this environment, how to get registered and logged in, and how to save your notebooks and so forth. Step-by-step step, runs you through, check it out. That's the first place you want to go. When you click inside of here, it will open up this framework here, which is a list of all of our master notebooks. Someone put in the chat earlier about how can I get started and I'm new to Jupyter Notebooks. I just want to see how a notebook interacts with satellite data. You want to click on Getting Started ODC and CoLab. Check out that one. Follow the steps there. That's a real good beginner notebook. These are generally in order of complexity and, uh, and also popularity because a lot of people use Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 the most. And so I'm going to demonstrate for you Cloud Statistics for Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 Data Viewer. So when you open Cloud Statistics Notebook for Sentinel-2, here is what you get. You get a link that looks like this, and you see a little button here, Opening CoLab. You're going to want to click the Opening CoLab link. When it opens up in CoLab, you'll see a little CO next to the name of the, of the uh, file. And this allows you all of the menus associated with running. So I can just do a runtime run all and just start the process of running. So just to walk you through the steps and the pieces of what these notebooks look like, the top half of this or the top couple lines is installing a, um, a Python module and running our open data cube setup and populating the database. Basically what this says is I wanna run a couple scripts that set up this environment of this open data cube connecting to Earth Engine data sets and then running the rest of the code you see below. Those two lines at the top of this notebook is all you really need to get this set up and running. The rest of the notebook is fairly common and generic in a sense that um, we're using the tools within the open data cube, but these are the kind of things where I can take this notebook and share it in other environments. So when you run it, it will stall in these first two steps to ask you for an Earth Engine authorization. It takes a couple minutes to go through and then it will run through the notebook. So here's what the notebooks look like in terms of the code and I'll show you one that's completed. These are all pre-completed so you can just walk through them before even running them to see what they look like. So this one is Cloud Statistics. It's opening up an, uh, the API I talked about, our Open Data Cube API. And then it's importing some utilities. And this is where we import, um, you know, RGB, display Mac utilities, X-Array, NumPy. These are all the normal things that you would think about that you want to import some uh, code in the background to help you do these analyses. We then connect to the Sentinel-2 product. We define a region using a latitude longitude. It, it picks the center point and then a box size. And then we pick the time extent. In this case, it's just a couple months. So it shows you, you can click on the map, you can zoom in and out. If I touch any place on the map, it'll show me a lat long. So if I wanna pick a different spot somewhere else in the world, go find it on the map, click a lat long, and you can enter that lat long up here and change the code. But basically we're running this little test case over Mombasa. And then you go down here, there's a little building a cloud coverage table and it builds the table, which gives you the dates of the scenes that are taken. And the clean percentage tells me how many clean pixels are in, the, in that scene, the percentage. So higher percentages like scene number three, 94%. That means it's about 6% cloudy, 94% clean. And then finally, at the end, we have a little plot. This is the time series plot of the scenes and how cloudy they are. And this is where I define, I'm gonna look at time slice number three, and this is a true color and a false color image. You can see about 6% clouds. You can see some of the clouds in the scene. So this is an example for Sentinel-2. This is a really 
simple way to sift through Landsat or Sentinel-2 data, take a peek at what the scenes look like, find out is this viable and easy to use. It's really a great and simple way. So let me jump over to Sentinel-1. This is where it gets a little more interesting and different. So in Sentinel-1, we're looking at radar data. and We look at two bands of information. We look at a VV band and a VH band. These are the, the angle of polarization, so vertical, vertical, and vertical, horizontal. It's how the signal is sent to the Earth and reflected back to the, the satellite, which then captures that information. How it scatters off, as the, off of the ground is basically what we're measuring. And based on what you're looking at, that scattering profile is different. So if I go down and I look at, uh, this is a case here, this is over Bangladesh. This is a, a rice farming area uh, in Bangladesh. And we again, load in the data. Here's all the acquisition dates. It gives me the dates of the acquisitions. And then it gives me a little histogram plot. And what you see here in the histogram plot, this is VV and VH histogram. This little knob right here is all the water. And this little knob is associated with all of the land features. So there's a difference between how things are scattered off of water and land. And this is what the grayscale image looks like. And you can see water, this little river running through the middle is dark. The darker things are, the more that the signal is scattered away. So that's basically water or non-vegetated areas. And the vegetated areas or urban areas, things that would scatter a lot are tend to be white. And this is a, a false color image. And then finally, we look at some really cool things, which is looking at multi-date backscatter products where I'm looking at how different rice fields are growing at different times. And that's what these colors are associated with. So I'm not gonna go into the detail of what, this, what these results mean. What I just wanna make sure that you know is that this is a Jupyter Notebook, fairly simple. All of the notebooks that I've shown you here that are listed in this master set, we built them so that they run from beginning to end in approximately five minutes or less. So you can run every one of these in five minutes or less. You can modify the settings, change the location, rerun it yourself and play around with it. It will teach you a little bit about Python. It'll teach you a little bit about how to interact with the Jupyter Notebook environment. They're really quite easy to learn, really easy to learn. So finally, what I wanna show you is a, a notebook that I just ran. Did I run this thing? I mean, yeah, I, I ran it this morning. So here's what I did with this notebook. I copied the Sentinel-1 Data Viewer notebook into my Google Drive environment. I modified the notebook and I created what I'm gonna call here Brian's Sentinel-1 flooding example. Notice that it has CO for collab, but next to it, it has the little triangle which says, this is coming from my personal Google Drive. I have modified this notebook and the, where I modified it was that I modified the Latlon position. I'm now looking for flooding over San Miguel. And this is a uh, flooding in El Salvador that happened uh, during a hurricane. And I wanted to see, could I find it? Here's the acquisition dates. These are dates before the storm and after the storm. So I'm gonna compare an image before and after the storm. Can I find the flooding? And what I did with this notebook is I took a few features out of the prior notebook that I didn't necessarily need. And I just saved the couple images that I wanted for my solution. So basically I simplified the notebook. Here is a RGB backscatter. And what this is showing is all these areas in black are the flooding. The lake is in the middle. All this water surrounding the lake is newly flooded uh, areas, and this is mountains on the south. So the last thing I want to show you is what I did in this notebook was I compared acquisition number four, which was before the storm, to acquisition number six, which was after the storm, and you can see the dates of those acquisitions. And I said, apply a threshold here that shows me those pixels that had a significant change in backscatter. And what I'm really looking for is a backscatter decreasing, something that was vegetation, scattered at high amounts and suddenly became water where the scattering uh, reflected off of the surface and now it's looking at water. And when I compare those two and I put a threshold, here's what I get. Every area in red is a newly flooded area synonymous with flooding. 
I compared these results with results from the Europeans and some results from the Germans who had used other satellites to do the same thing. I got the same exact results. Very simple what you see here. Easy for me to run this uh, in, in quick notice. And uh, that's all. So I'll, I'm going to wrap up there. I'll stop sharing my screen here. And let me get back to that. Um, hey, Brian. Uh, Kent here. That was perfect. We're right at the, the mark for the Q&A time. All right. Any questions out there? I see a few. Many other data sets existing Earth engine. Can this environment now access them? The answer is yes. Uh, we can we can do that. We we haven't built notebooks specifically to access some of the other data sets, but there's no reason we cannot do this. Um, in some cases, there might need to be a little bit of a setup in terms of the database. If you want to contact us, we'd be more than help, happy to help you out. Maybe post a question over in that user forum, and we'll see if we can't. Um, help bring those together. Our ultimate goal is try to take advantage of as many of these data sets as you can. You know, satellite, non-satellite data sets together provide an incredible value. Um, how much of the data in the Open Data Cube is open to members of the public? 100%. We try very hard in everything we've done with Open Data Cube. Open Data Cube is open source software completely from beginning to end. We promote the use of open satellite data. So one of the reasons I go to Earth Engine is their data is open and available for us to use. There's data sets out on Amazon. There's data sets in many parts of the world that are free and open. That's what we promote. Can this be done with commercial data sets? Absolutely. It's just not something we focus on because our goal is to use um, the others. Uh, can CoLab uh, use other data than then uh, yeah, the common ones, absolutely, it can be done. Uh, answered that one. Uh, where can the notebooks be found? OpenEarthAlliance.org slash sandbox. Check that out and it'll point you to a link for those notebooks and the demonstration I showed today. Uh, looks like someone's interested in my thresholding flood extent for a flood that happened recently. I'd be happy to work with you on that. Reach out to me directly. Uh, you can just Google me on Brian Kilo NASA, you'll find me, or post something in the user forum. Um, I'd be more than happy to help you set up a little demo uh, to find the flooding that you think uh, existed. We actually had a really interesting case study where I was working with a, a colleague in Australia, and he said, hey, there was some flooding near my house in a storm about you know three months ago. I wonder if I can find it. He did the analysis and he was able to find it. And he thought it was really cool because he just did it really fast on his own. And it was very simple to find. Again, the beauty of that radar data, it finds water easily and you don't have to deal with clouds. Uh, is there any plan to add more data sets to the cube, particularly MODIS? MODIS is in there in terms of the Earth Engine uh, data sets. You can definitely use MODIS. We have not developed any uh, notebooks to, to dabble with that. No reason it can't be done. If you have some ideas or things that you'd like to explore, we'd like to help you get going. So use that user forum, reach out to me directly. Either way, happy to help. I think we got them all. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Yep. OK, let, let's pivot to some use of Jupyter Notebooks on uh, the ESA side. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Simona Montavoni. Uh, so he's with uh, the Meteorological and Environmental Earth Observation Company uh, that support ESA. Uh, he's going to be demonstrating the use of Jupyter Notebooks to perform data analysis with Earth observations using ESA's Payload Data Ground System or PGDS Data Cube. Uh, Simone, over to you. Okay, thank, thanks, uh, Clinton, for uh, uh, the introduction. So this will save some time. Uh, uh, to me in uh, introducing uh, myself. And uh, I will start saying that I'm really excited uh, in uh, uh, presenting uh, what uh, uh, we are uh, doing with ESA, with the European Space Agency, uh, to improve uh, and boost uh, the uh, exploitation of uh, uh, the ESA and third party mission uh, uh, data. Uh, the subject uh, and the focus of the discussion will be this uh, uh, data cube and time series uh, data. Uh, and uh, uh, what we call uh, in the uh, ESA 
uh, environment, uh, the pixel-based uh, uh, access service. Uh, I think ISA uh, doesn't need uh, any introduction, but maybe for those of you that uh, uh, don't know uh, the, the space agency, uh, Kenton uh, in the uh, early introduction mentioned uh, that uh, behind the CEOs, there are uh, uh, 62 different agencies involved uh, and coordinating each other uh, to evolve uh, uh, the uh, space uh, sector. So ISA is one of these, uh, and uh, uh, being a space agency, uh, in its mandate uh, as the operation of uh, the data dissemination services. Uh, because of the variety of the data, this is done uh, usually uh, per satellite mission, and uh, several uh, uh, PDGS sections uh, exist. In each of these, you will find a common set of uh, services, uh, being these traditional and robust uh, uh, service, uh, but also uh, you will find uh, uh, how the services uh, are evolving and why. Uh, this is because uh, uh, the challenges uh, are changing, uh, the technologies uh, are changing, and the user requirements uh, uh, are also changing. So what I'm going to present today is uh, uh, how uh, the ESA PDGS Data Cube uh, is enabling uh, the pixel-based access uh, uh, service uh, and how this is used uh, to uh, uh, support the implementation of uh, uh, time series uh, time series analysis. Uh, we already touched uh, uh, how many different uh, uh, interfaces exist, and we will get back uh, in a while uh, to this. But just to give you an idea and materialize uh, what a pixel-based uh, uh, access service is, uh, we can imagine uh, that. Uh, some data exists with uh, its uh, native granularity, as in this case, uh, uh, there is a global coverage uh, of uh, soil moisture. But as a user, being in Europe, I'm just interested in uh, uh, European data. What the pixel-based access service is uh, providing is the ability uh, to subset and extract, retrieve the data at the area and time of interest that you really need. And moving uh, uh, from uh, globe to continent uh, uh, to country, at the end, uh, we, uh, we came across uh, to the single pixel. And uh, uh, the, the main benefit of this uh, service uh, is uh, optimizing the data transfer and optimizing the processing needed to explore and analyze this data. Even a single uh, or a simple uh, visualization uh, will, will have a benefit from this. Uh, uh, from this service. Uh, again, uh, I don't like to repeat uh, myself uh, in, uh, uh, in what others uh, uh, said, but there were questions about, uh, is this service uh, available for all the data managed by ESA? Uh, no, the, the short answer is no, uh, because there is a process uh, to enable uh, uh, the service. So you see here the list of what today is managed uh, uh, by the service. Uh, and I also put what is currently ongoing development uh, at ESA that will be uh, presented uh, uh, later in, uh, in the demo. These data have different uh, temporal coverage, uh, have different uh, spatial coverage, but most important, I think they have a different uh, data format, uh, data granularity, spatial uh, granularity. And the service uh, uh, is uh, homogenizing and uh, let's say improving the way the user uh, will have access uh, uh, to the data. Uh, again, no single user exists. And this is why several user interfaces uh, uh, are needed. Depending on the uh, type of user you are, uh, I think here you find uh, the three most uh, uh, diffused uh, uh, user interfaces. On the right, you see how machine to machine or developers uh, are working. So the service is providing API uh, for those uh, uh, category of user. On the left side, you see how humans or what we call humans do prefer for exploiting the data that is mostly uh, a map browser uh, to, to play with uh, calendars uh, and dates uh, uh, to, uh, to do your job. But what is of interest uh, of today is uh, the interfaces uh, uh, from, uh, from Jupiter. And this is more for scientists, uh, at least in the ESA domain. Uh, why? Because 
uh, with Jupyter, we are enabling, we are providing to the user the possibility to, uh, uh, to live coding uh, uh, their, uh, their algorithm uh, close, uh, uh, close to the data. Again, not the final solution, not the most scalable uh, solution, uh, but for sure is helping uh, in improving uh, the user experience. And this is what I'm trying to summarize in, in these uh, slides, because it was never easy to uh, define uh, which demo to present uh, uh, to you, uh, leading uh, mainly the technical implementation of the service. Uh, but I managed to find this couple of examples, that is how to retrieve a time series uh, over your country uh, of interest, and moving a bit forward, <coughs> how to compute a monthly change map over your country. I think the second uh, use case is what we call anomaly if we talk about uh, uh, the climate uh, domain or what we call uh, a difference between one year and another year uh, if, if we are not a climate, uh, a climate expert. What I try to put in the different steps is uh, comparing how traditional services uh, uh, work with respect uh, uh, to the uh, pixel-based access service. We see here that we have less step, uh, steps to, uh, uh, to implement, and uh, we can access uh, uh, since the beginning uh, to the exact amount of data that, uh, uh, that we need, uh, being uh, a retrieval, a pure retrieval, or being a computational uh, exercise, you see that if we look at the time resources, uh, you will have a benefit uh, because uh, you move uh, in this example from 10 minutes uh, to a couple of minutes, or in a more complex uh, uh, or more demanding uh, use case, uh, you move uh, from 30 minutes uh, uh, to, uh, to six minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say these were the uh, main uh, requirement uh, collected uh, across uh, different, uh, different communities. Uh, so to uh, exploit the service, uh, I mentioned before, we have uh, different user interfaces. Uh, uh, here you see the URL to connect uh, to the service. Uh, you have to log in. Uh, not an issue if you don't have an ESA account yet, because you can follow uh, directly the registration uh, uh, process uh, and uh, you will be authorized uh, uh, to connect uh, uh, to the system. Once you are there, uh, you start exploiting uh, and enjoying uh, the human interface. You can add uh, one of the product of interest uh, to your basket. Uh, once you have selected, you can start exploring in time at the native granularity, as I was uh, uh, showing before. But you can search your area of interest. And doing that, you will start uh, reducing the volume of the data and you will start focusing uh, on your area of interest still to the single pixel. And what about to do the same uh, exercise uh, with Jupyter? You see in the interface, there is uh, the link uh, to the Jupyter environment. You will be forwarded uh, to the proper space. And I think from here we can switch to the live, uh, to the live part. Hope you still see my screen, and we move live into the system. You see that I'm connecting to the Jupyter workspace that is loading. Okay, this is running uh, in the ESA. Uh, cloud environment, so uh, all the resources uh, are powered uh, by uh, and offered uh, by ESA. Again, uh, uh, as mentioned also by, uh, by Brian, limitation exists, so uh, uh, your uh, uh, Jupyter environment uh, has uh, a typical uh, uh, resources of uh, a few cores and uh, uh, eight gigabyte of RAM, but you can start exploiting uh, the results. You will find some examples, uh, generic examples, let's say starting with an index. This is part of uh, our best practice as well uh, to provide uh, an introduction, very short introduction, because there is no need to 
uh, redo the magic uh, and uh, uh, enormous work that the Jupiter community is doing in case uh, just go there and surf uh, uh, their content. But we do provide a simple example on how to extract uh, <coughs> the data uh, using uh, uh, this interface. Uh, one example of interest, because uh, uh, in the questions uh, there were people asking, is it possible with Jupyter running animation of the data? Uh, feel free to connect <coughs> and click uh, uh, step by step uh, the, uh, the notebook. Uh, I just jump to the end of this one, okay? To present that if you did access the data and if you created the stack of data you need to animate, this is one of the possibility offered by Jupyter. Offered by the ESA PDGS environment or offered by the packages that are imported uh, inside the notebook? The answer is the second, for, uh, obviously. So we are not are implementing uh, all the functionality. We are integrating uh, existing capability in this uh, uh, useful environment that is uh, uh, the ESA, uh, that is the offered by, uh, by Jupyter. Uh, you see here a uh, few examples, one per uh, data set. This is a live uh, uh, service and, uh, and project. So uh, there is uh, uh, a plan to add uh, example uh, per data set. So every data set uh, uh, will have his own uh, uh, notebook to present the, uh, uh, the way to interact from user. Uh, the way the notebook is structured is uh, let's say standard in the sense that the first step uh, is about loading uh, all the packages. And then we describe step-by-step step how the user has to code uh, to, to run that, uh, that step. You see, for example, uh, the click on the login uh, uh, button in, uh, uh, in the human interface, how it is converted uh, in, uh, uh, in the Jupyter environment. There is a step to authenticate and to be authorized uh, to get access to the data. Uh, why? Because uh, this is how the uh, dissemination service uh, uh, control the access uh, to the data. And this is how uh, the, the step is implemented uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Jupyter the node. Then uh, how to browse the catalog. Uh, you see again, uh, there is uh, uh, an API uh, to get the list uh, of the available data set. Uh, you see small send other uh, examples here. How to select and get all the details about uh, a specific data set you are interested in. Uh, this is the CI thickness uh, that uh, we are animating. Uh, you see, you have uh, uh, the poor or rich metadata description uh, according uh, uh, to the curation of, uh, uh, of the mission of the mission manager. And then you start uh, exploiting uh, uh, the visualization part. Again, I'm not repeating what uh, uh, Esther presented uh, in, the first, uh, in the first demo, but the main scope of this uh, uh, step is extract the data I want uh, to visualize and pass to the step of the, of the visualization. Uh, again, using Cartopy uh, will do a nice representation uh, in a 2D or 3D uh, globe. But if you like more uh, other packages uh, for a visualization, you will have the possibility to uh, uh, install uh, your favorite your favorite package. Then, <coughs> let's say, <coughs> uh, uh, once uh, you register and connect to the system, you will find, uh, let's say, a series of uh, notebooks uh, uh, we have presented for a uh, uh, the today uh, demo. Uh, there are, let's say, uh, pairs of uh, notebooks uh, that refer only to the uh, access process, uh, in this case, uh, uh, soil moisture, uh, soil moisture data, how to do this uh, through the traditional service and how to do this uh, through the uh, PDGS uh, data cube service. Let me just open to see the introduction of these two examples because we put in the introduction uh, a graphical representation of the scope uh, of the notebook itself. The scope here is 
to extract uh, the daily coverage of, uh, uh, of the soil moisture uh, product, uh, and then uh, 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 subset the data over your country of interest. And you see, if you do this, relying on uh, the traditional dissemination service and the native uh, coverage is the global uh, coverage, we have uh, forced it to move uh, uh, the, the full amount of data uh, to the notebook uh, uh, and then uh, to subset uh, uh, the data. And you will find the steps here. Relying on the data queue PDGS, you can specify at the query time, the area of interest. So you will have uh, access directly to the data uh, over, uh, over your country uh, of interest. And what is presented in this pair of uh, notebooks uh, for uh, uh, the retrieval and visualization of the data uh, is represented uh, better here in this, uh, let's say, use case of uh, computing uh, the uh, anomaly uh, between uh, uh, 2021 and uh, uh, the previous uh, couple of years in soil moisture. So again, thanks to the pixel-based access, uh, we will reduce the amount uh, of the data. And step by step, <coughs> what, will, uh, <coughs> what the code uh, is presenting to you is uh, uh, how to extract uh, in the step two, how to setting uh, the, the uh, how to define the setting uh, uh, of, uh, of the use case. I need the data of 2020 and 2019. Uh, I need the data over a single month. Uh, I need to extract uh, uh, this uh, monthly data and uh, having the possibility to compute on the fly, the monthly average will speed up and boost uh, more and more the computational time. And if we look here at the time uh, on the different steps, you see that in this case, uh, uh, accessing uh, the uh, country level data is taking uh, uh, three minutes. If we look at the equivalent time in the traditional service, we first need to access the global data. And if we look at that time is, 10 times uh, uh, larger. So this is what, uh, uh, let's say, the backend service uh, is, uh, is uh, providing. And this is uh, uh, how the Jupyter Notebook uh, uh, can be used to exploit uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that benefit. Uh, I'm not going click by click uh, into, uh, into the presentation. Uh, I think the... Uh, uh, let's say the, the message and the benefit uh, of, uh, of the using of Jupiter for capacity building uh, uh, has been clearly stated uh, also by the other colleagues. And uh, I'm uh, happy to answer uh, your questions, if any, or uh, uh, just uh, send me an email uh, if you need uh, extra information after this, uh, uh, this meeting. Thanks, Simone. It oh, looks ahead, like there's Don. one question. Oh, I was just say there's one question. It says, um, is the SMOS use case in anomaly comparison Jupyter notebook available? Or on anomaly comparison Jupyter notebook available? Yes, yes. This is part of, uh, again, maybe it was not uh, evident, but uh, if you uh, register to the service that is available on uh, uh, datacube.pdgs.io.isa.int, uh, you can get access to Jupyter and this set of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, examples uh, have been packaged and prepared uh, for you. And this is, these are part of the base image. So these are uh, uh, shared across uh, all the people uh, uh, joining the community. Great. And I think that's the last question that I'm seeing. Okay, very good. Simone, thanks very much uh, for that excellent demonstration. And now I think we can turn to Matt Paget from CSIRO. Um, Matt is going to be demonstrating uh, the CIOS Earth Analytics and Interoperability Lab uh, and its capabilities. 
uh, and how they allow, uh, which allows CIOS members to use Jupyter notebooks to explore the use of big data processing tools uh, with Earth observations data. So Matt, over to you. Thank you, Kenton, and hello, everyone. Uh, so this talk, it's a, <clears throat> a little bit, bit more technical than some of our previous ones. The previous ones have, have set the groundwork around the use of Jupyter Notebooks. And this presentation starts to look at how we can do the bigger data processing with the same Jupyter Notebooks going forward. And, and largely, this is about how do we manage large data sets that are that are larger than the compute capacity or the memory availability available within our Jupyter lab or um, notebook environment. Hi, Matt. Matt could you oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was going to say the same, same thing. question. Could you, yeah, swap displays. We're seeing the presenter view. Ah, right, yes. Understand. In the top left, there's just a button that um, lets you do that, swap displays. Better? Perfect. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yep. Right. Okay. So CIOS, um, particularly the Working Group for Information Systems and Services, have uh, developed and deployed an Earth Analytics Interoperability Laboratory. This slide here is a bit of a, an overview of what the laboratory is. Um, the next one describes some of the rationale and, and, and activities within the, the laboratory. Um, the laboratory itself is a, is a system of services. It includes the Open Data Cube software that uh, Brian talked to earlier, uh, some software around data pipelines for connecting to various data sources, um, all the way through, and, and enough tools there for the exploratory data analysis with Python notebooks, all the way through to running scalable and operational workflows. In its essence, it's a Kubernetes cluster, um, which allows us to have scalable compute and services, um, a, a minimum amount of infrastructure using up uh, resources um, and, and money uh, when, when no one is using the system and automatically scaling up more resources within the Kubernetes cluster as more users and, and more uh, computing requirements are put upon the system. Kubernetes also has a self-healing capability. So if individual compute nodes or services within the system um, uh, fall over or, or die for some reason, um, Kubernetes will, will recreate that service. So the, the downtime for any feature is, is minimal and reasonably transparent for users. Uh, the whole system is hosted in Amazon Web Services and uh, deployed out with and managed via Terraform as a, as a software suite there. We actually have a, a, a few deployments of the same ecosystem um, for, for, different, for different groups um, and different markets and different activities. Um, and one of the beauties of it, uh, we think, is that we can, we can share and learn um, different capabilities across the different deployments. Um, whether it's uh, um, doing some intense earth observation mapping or, or interoperability exercises between groups and between data sets, or exploring the, the transition from research um, and development into commercial operations. But the Earth, the CIOS Earth Analytics Interoperability Laboratory is, is more specifically um, around validating and understanding interoperability um, aspects, concerns between CIOS organizations and working groups. 
Um, so the CIOS itself hosts and manages a, a range of services um, from indexing Earth observation data sets and, and managing um, metadata collections and catalogues through to informing and testing and, and co-developing um, data services and data provision services to the global community. Uh, CIOS maintain and manage a set of these technologies and also best practice documents associated with, with many of these things. And, and as technology evolves, uh, the, uh, the best practices need to be updated. So we, we're also using the, the laboratory as, as a platform for testing and exercising um, what are the new technologies coming through and, and how will CIOS respond to those. And we explore these challenges together within CIOS and in particular by supporting the various working groups in CIOS. So uh, there are two working groups of note here, uh, the working group on disasters and the working group on coasts. Um, some of the features associated with the, the cluster, what, what, as a user, you get your own space and your own shared um, project spaces. Um, within the system for, for storing data and managing notebook collections and so forth. Same examples as, as you've seen earlier in, in this webinar. Um, authenticated access and uses controls across the, the system and the services. Users are able to develop CAS, custom DAS clusters uh, for their own um, scalable compute and distributed computing uses. And that's largely the topic of this presentation. We'll talk more about DASC over the next number of slides. Uh, and I guess a common thread here that really ties this down, uh, the, the EAIL laboratory to this webinar is that it, it's just another service in which we can run Jupyter Notebooks. And the differentiator here in, in what we're doing with the laboratory is using those notebooks at a, a big data compute scale. So a reference Dask, what is Dask? Dask is a, a Python library um, that we use to automate and uh, distributed as parallel processing of array data. And these array data can be larger than the available memory in, in Jupyter. So every, every Jupyter server runs on a node and that node has a certain amount of compute memory available to it. And um, unless we have a, a scenario, well, we, you need a scenario where you can uh, exercise and access larger compute resources close to your Jupyter node uh, notebook to, to process the large data sets. The details of Dask is that it splits up a processing job as described in a notebook. Uh, into small chunks and small tasks, chunks of data and, and, and small tasks and activities. And then puts all these into an execution tree. And then uh, when, you, when you go to run a part of that tree, that is the time when the, the data is accessed, read into the compute um, memory and, and the, your code in your notebook runs against that small chunk of, of data. What we've found is that the, the size of this execution tree really starts to matter. It starts to inform how, how well the rest of your, your whole processing workflow will, will operate. But some positives that really come out of this space is that there are many libraries in, in Python that now support Dask natively. So, such as uh, X-Array and Pandas and, and, the, and the machine learning uh, capabilities through Scikit. There are also visualization libraries. And there's, there's an example in a few slides time um, that shows some interactive visualization capabilities. So what we're doing here is part of, part of the journey here is is how we scale up our problems, our analyses that we're trying to 
address. As an individual, you have access to a, you can have access to a notebook and you can process a small area and, and time range and you, you're sometimes limited by the available memory you have. But this is a really good place in a, a point number one there. It's a really good place to do your algorithm development. Very iterative. And that's why we, we enjoy working with notebooks. To go to the next level, exploratory analysis, we're generally increasing our area of interest. Uh, and we see, uh, for us, a, a moderate size activity would be a couple of hundred kilometers squared, a few links, a few years worth of, of data, and a modest DAS cluster size of, of 100 cores or so, noting that many compute nodes themselves will have multiple cores. So it's, it's not quite 100 computers, I'm saying there. At this stage, when we're exercising the, the notebook, we're looking at how, the, how well the algorithm performs. Where are the bottlenecks within the algorithm? Are there different ways we can, we can perform the, um, the algorithm described in the notebook? Um, that can be a combination of, of Python, understanding Python and how to work with numeric arrays a little bit differently, or it could be a matter of storing interim results and so forth. In part three, performance optimization is where we're now looking at taking our compute resources and making sure our algorithm is, is very scalable across those compute resources. So finding more of the parallel aspects that we can do within our algorithm. And we start to optimize how we construct our DAS graph in this space. And we can start operating up to many hundreds of cores now because we know we're gaining a lot of efficiency out of each individual core. At this time, we're reducing the algorithm bottlenecks and we're making that graph, that DAS schedule tree um, a lot more manageable um, and faster to operate. And then the fourth part, almost the holy grail, is when we get to a, an operational space. We've gone from a, a notebook in development and now we can operate it and run it uh, on large scale areas and have confidence in its, in its results. Um, at this time, we start looking at multiple DAS clusters and we'd need a, probably need a workflow manager to wrap around to organize and, and marshal all the activities and manage for robustness within our system and fail over all various services. At this time, we're not optimizing the algorithm anymore, but we're probably optimizing the cost of the system. Um, and using as, getting as much efficiency out of the compute resources as we possibly can. The uh, table in the bottom right is, is another view on, on some of these aspects, but with a, a slightly more technical um, bend to the numbers. So here are a couple of examples. These are just uh, video screenshots of, of Python, uh, of our DAS processing. The, the, the video at the top is uh, showing a, a process working through and the colored bars uh, are changing according to the, the progress of each of the tasks. So you can see an amount of activity operating in parallel. And what we're trying to do in these pictures, in the, in the graph picture in the top is, is reduce down that um, schedule tree. So we're getting less white space and more compute um, happening closer to 100% of the time. Uh, the bottom video is showing the interactive plotting capabilities using a, a Python library called HoloViews. And this is a Python library that's, that has native DAS support. This means it's, as you move around the graph, uh, the, the plotted picture that is of these green paddocks and things, uh, the, 
visualization software in the notebook side is making a call back to the desk data, the, the data stored out on the desk servers and is being rendered out on the desk servers to be come back as a picture to the, to the Jupyter notebook. What this means is you're not pulling all the data back to the, the Jupyter notebook itself. The data all stays out on the desk workers and you only render the, the piece of data that you're looking at in your viewport at the resolution you're looking at in the viewport. This makes it quite exciting because we get to ex visually explore uh, really rich data sources at full resolution and large areas. So what are some learnings that we've, uh, we've bought from, from this activity so far? Um, what, how, how does the process going from just notebooks through to the distributed processing with DASC really work for us? The good points are that the DASC processing makes, makes distributed processing, sorry, DASC makes distributed processing really easy. Just, if, if we've got the technology sitting behind it, it's quite easy to set up your X-Array or Pandas model to use DASC and it goes and does it. We can analyze and visualize multi-year data sets for small areas very simply. The bad, it sort of makes distributed processing too easy. One expects, uh, a new user can expect just to offer a, an algorithm to DASC and say, go make this faster. It's never, not quite as simple as that, we find. Because there are thresholds, they're around the size of the DAS graph and the memory usage across each of the nodes that still needs to be considered. And it can be quite difficult to diagnose and optimize down in the system of DAS. We're, we're learning more all the time. And generally, we find even with DAS and its improvements uh, to our work, Distributing, distributed processing is still hard. You still need to have a, a good understanding of how um, multi-processor, multi-node systems work. And while optimizing an algorithm can speed your process, optimizing an algorithm in DAS can speed your process up significantly, um, we do find it starts, once you really start to optimize it with, with DAS, you start to alter the flow of the code from the original notebook. And that, that in a sense, we could see that starts to break that um, continuity perhaps from a development notebook through to an operational notebook. All of this work with DASC and Earth Observation Data is, is work in progress. There's a very active and rich community around DASC and geospatial analysis. Um, a month or two ago, they, they held their 2021 summit and uh, many of their presentations are, are available on YouTube. There's an example for uh, one of our colleagues in Geoscience Australia, who is also looking at this problem. So, so we're associated with Open Data Cube as well. Finally, um, just uh, an exam some examples that we, we currently run um, within the not, uh, not always within the Earth, sorry, within the Earth, Earth Analytics Interoperability Laboratory and other systems like it. Um, we have run large DASC based processing jobs and gained significant efficiency uh, across some application examples in forestry, mineral exploration, fire risk analysis fractional cover processing, the, the global scale as well. And uh, some really neat um, algorithm I saw the other day around coastal bathymetry from Sentinel-2 imagery. The challenges remain around understanding how DASC works under the hood and, and optimizing that the task graph, adjusting workflows accordingly. But what we're starting to find is we're, we're getting it through practice, we're getting more examples of, of where those thresholds might come into play for most common applications and, and notebooks that we see and building our, our set of resources around diagnostic tools and methods. And the, I think the, the interactive data visualization 
being able to zoom in and out and pan left to right of very large data sets held in distributed memory is, is really quite exciting. One of our users in, in one of our projects uh, holds our current title um, of running up a DAS cluster with up to 4,000 cores to, to run his um, significant geospatial processing. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. I'm happy to take some, uh, some questions. Thanks much, Matt. Uh, let me turn to Lauren. I think she's got a couple of questions from the chat. Yep, so we have two questions. Um, the first is, what are the costs to access these data and services and who pays for the computational resources? Do users need to be a member of a recognized institution? And does that institution need to be a member of CIOS? I don't know all the final details on, on the CIOS recognized institution part, but I, I suspect that would put oneself in good stead. Uh, the costs of the data and services are, are managed. Some of the other, uh, for example, Brian's demonstration and Simone's demonstrations and, and, and part of um, Esther's as well at the beginning, uh, are interfaces into data, data archives and capabilities and services that are, are generally free. So we're really trying to open up access to, to many people. In the Earth Analytics Interoperability Lab component, it's not necessarily open up to the, the public. What we're what we're we're doing is is building a, a higher purpose capability for particular organisations and and collaborative efforts under CIOS. Generally speaking, though, we do try to manage and understand the costs associated with these compute. We find the costs are. Um, very comparable, if not less, than managing compute systems oneself. Being able to use the compute resources of the cloud, in this case, Amazon, but similarly, as, as Brian showed with Google, um, we, we, we generally find to be very cost-effective. So while we might pass on the, the actual compute and resource costs associated with a particular processing activity, that uh, we find our users are very happy with that, with those costs being passed through, very manageable. Okay, thank you. And for the second question, um, does this Jupyter service have the capability similar to geospatial software as in, um, can you add layers? Yeah, so a part of this, uh, part of the laboratory is, is largely just using the Python data analysis ecosystem. So uh, access to all the the standard geoprocessing, geospatial processing libraries, the pandas processing stack, and, and so forth. So while one can use the open data cube to access a, an array, a three-dimensional array of Earth observation data, once you've accessed that data, you have a what is called an X-array object, which is a, 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 a numerical array in Python. And you're at that point, you're in the Python ecosystem. So it's easy to connect with machine learning libraries or geospatial analysis libraries, um, do uh, data selection based off shape files or other complementary data sets that you may have outside of, well, just in your own user space or accessible from other places. Thank you, Matt. I think that's it for the question. So I think I'll turn it over to Kent. Thanks, Lauren. Um, actually, I want to thank all of the demonstrators so far. Uh, uh, those were really um, great presentations, uh, great demonstrations, uh, very interesting, and everybody made great time. So um, actually, I think it would be, um, Good to turn to participants in the webinar and uh, ask if they have any quick follow-up questions for any of the demonstrators before we turn to the panel. I'd be fine to take uh, just two to three minutes for that kind of thing.
I see a question for Esther. Jasmine has capabilities to order regional data sets depending what they are subject to NCO approval. Uh, yeah, yes, Anna, I, I, I is an answer. You already answered. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was an answer. To, somebody asked the question earlier on about the data sets that can be hosted. So I was just following up on that. Um, we all have slightly different um, architectures, and because we've got um, groups, workspaces, and and an archive associated with CEDA, um, that is something that we could look at doing for someone else if it's relevant to, to our UK NCO community. Very good. Um, well, if there are no more um, questions in the, the chat, uh, being forwarded to the demonstrators. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because I can't see I can't see all the faces as well now. Um, well, we're going to take a few minutes to turn to a panel discussion. Um, uh, we have a few panelists that I'm going to introduce uh, shortly. Um, and uh, this panel discussion is going to focus more on the um, capacity development side of the uses of Jupyter Notebooks for Earth observations that we've talked about uh, in the course of the webinar so far. Um, so. Let me shift over to introduce the panelists. Uh, so I'm uh, going to give each of the panelists just a moment to introduce themselves. Um, uh, we're going to meet Edward Boma from Digital Earth Africa, Haley Evers King from Umetsat, and Sean McCartney, who's um, actually wears multiple hats. He's with the, the company uh, Science Systems and Applications Incorporated, and he supports both NASA Develop and NASA RSET to capacity development um, activities within, within NASA. Uh, we're gonna turn uh, just for a moment to uh, Edward's introduction slide. Uh, Haley and Sean don't have slides, so we'll flip back to these, this, uh, this, these pictures here uh, for, for Haley and Sean. So Edward, let me turn to you. Thank you, Russ. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Edward Fofombu. I'm based in Ghana, Accra. Um, I work with Digital Earth Africa as the technical manager in which we support institutions and countries within Africa uh, to make use of analysis ready at observation data, basically for, to make impact and decision making. Building the capacity of this institution is actually very, very important especially when they, are being, when they are new to the Jupyter platform. So Digital Light Africa has, Africa has actually make it crucial to enable institutions to be able to develop their own algorithm of products that they want to use within the area of interest that they are working with. So taking capacity development for Digital Light Africa is very, very important to actually allow most of the institutions to be able to use this platform. So as being part of the panelists, at least I'll also talk more about why the, why the capacity development is much more important. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Um, and now let me flip the slide back and let's turn to Haley. Haley, we're not hearing you. So let me let me pause on that for just a second. And, uh, and maybe you can put something in the chat if you're having audio trouble, but let's turn to Sean McCartney. Great, thanks, Kent. And thank you to CIOS for organizing this webinar. And thank you to all the conveners and panelists throughout the session. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm here to discuss how the NASA Develop Program uses Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks to teach programming. For those not familiar with the Develop Program, Develop as part of NASA's Applied Sciences and Capacity Building Programs. 
Develop addresses a wide array of environmental and public policy issues by partnering with a diverse group of end users. One of the opportunities offered by Develop is participating in software carpentry workshops. These workshops build technical capacity in essential data and computational skills for conducting efficient, open, and reproducible research. So I'll be here today to talk about Develop's efforts to disseminate best practices for a program. Thanks. Hi, thanks, Sean. Um, now let me reach back out and see if we can um, if we can connect with Haley. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes, we can hear Perfect. you great. Okay, sorry about that. I'm using a different laptop today. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm Haley Evers King. Um, I work for UMETSAT. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of us, um, we operate Europe's fleet of meteorological satellites, as well as a number of satellites under the European Commission's Copernicus program. And uh, this is where my role mostly sits. I'm actually an oceanographer by training, um, working with marine satellite data. And so I'm doing a lot of work under the Sentinel 3 and 6 missions. And um, as part of what I do, um, I'm in the user support section of UMETSAT. Um, we do a lot of user support, engagement and training. And we're finding that Jupyter Notebooks offer us a really excellent tool for helping people to get hands on with the data that we provide in various ways, um, both on sort of the small scale of the individual user working with their laptop all the way through to these big hosted processing and big data access systems. Um, so myself and my colleagues within our division have been working with notebooks probably over about the last four years um, as a tool and we're developing and learning all the time new ways that we can use this um, resource to help our users. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, thank you, Haley. Um, so let me flip back to this uh, just <laughs> blank slide here. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, we have an, a nice uh, section of time now for, for the panel discussion. Um, I'm going to direct um, two or three questions out to, to the invited panelists. Um, but in follow-up to the panelists' questions, I would invite even our, our demonstrators and other speakers to feel free to, to join in as well. Uh, so let's start with a question uh, to Edward Boma from Digital Earth Africa. So Edward, um, what support do you think is needed by new users to embrace uh, the Jupyter Notebooks technology and maintain their usage of it? Okay, so for new users who are trying to use the Jupyter Notebook, is already, when you go to these institutions, they already have access to uh, earth observation data whereby they actually download it and using software application like Esri, uh, they can, and Envy, they can do those processing. But coming to this environment, whereby they have to actually get knowledge in programming languages, especially Python, it mostly scares them off out of it when they, are, when they want to work with it. So basically the most support is to introduce them to the basic uh, level of Python languages and also work together with them on areas that they're actually working with for them to actually appreciate the capabilities of the Jupyter uh, notebook platform which they are using and this support is not actually a one day or a two day process but it's actually continuous process whereby you have to engage with them always so as part of digital let africa one of the possible ways we've actually done it is through every wednesday we have that part, a particular live session whereby we engage with all the users who are actually using the set platform to do their day to their daily activities. So we have this platform whereby we engage with them and talk to them. And if they have any other problem, they can share with us. So having that uh, recurring session has actually helped us to also get close to these new users. And they actually been amazing in actually working with this platform. And because there has been this friendship bond that has established between the users and us, anytime they face any problem, they reach out to us for us to support them on that. And through that, they have actually been able to use the system continuously. So that's how we're actually helping new users to use the Jupyter Notebook together with the earth observation data that is available on the platform. Thanks, Edward. Uh, let me turn to Sean. Uh, Sean, I think um, 
the the use of NASA develop of the software carpentry model that uh, Esther referred to early earlier in in the webinar is is maybe relevant to this question as well. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, Ken, and I'm happy to answer. Um, so circling back to software carpentry, Develop organizes three software carpentry workshops each year in collaboration with Colorado State University. Uh, these teach skills and use of the Unix shell, version control kit, programming with R, as well as programming with Python. The goal is to teach workshop attendees the basic concepts that all programming depends on. And we use Jupyter Notebooks because they support interactive data science and scientific computing across all programming languages. Uh, instructors walk learners through basic operations for Jupyter Notebooks, such as how to launch a Jupyter Notebook, how to create a, no uh, a new notebook, enter code, et cetera. But the focus is really more on the language than the tools. Uh, and watching instructors grow programs step by step and having workshop learners follow along on their own computers is a very effective way for them to learn how to navigate Jupyter Notebooks and build a workable mental model uh, of how programming works. And so that's really the focus of all these workshops that develop leads, uh, you know, three times a year in collaboration with Colorado State University. And I think it's really that hands-on that the participants, the learners get. And we have over 100 learners on every workshop uh, from a wide, uh, uh, diverse backgrounds from, uh, you know, uh, social sciences to uh, physical sciences, et cetera. And really having the, the, the walking through step-by-step and how do you build out programs is in a very effective way to communicate the, uh, the skills necessary. So thanks. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop this actually so that we can see the whole panel and uh, anybody that wants to chime in, I'm going to stop this share and go back to the gallery view. Uh, but let me turn to uh, Haley or even other of our speakers and see if you'd like to, to chime in on, on this question about how to support new users? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I really liked what Sean was saying there about um, some of the underpinning basic skills can be really important. And I think that made me think of um, a lot of what we're trying to do with our training and our experiences in the event site is meet the users where they are in their particular situation. We have a lot of people we're working with from a wide variety of different backgrounds in terms of their experience, in terms of where they are based, the type of institution they work at. And often we find that this influences the type of resource they have available, uh, both in terms of compute and finance um, and things like that. So how they can use the notebooks and where importantly they use them, whether it's their own individual laptop, um, a localized computer cluster at their institution or through a hosted service, you know, such as some of the great examples we've seen today um, can vary a lot. And in our training, we've had to try and adapt to help um, them to meet that particular need so that it fits their particular circumstances. And so that's required us to think quite a lot about how we write our notebooks in terms of how they work on different systems, how we provide guidance on the environments, um, how they access data. Um, you know, if the data is sat next to where they're working in a cloud environment, that's great. Not all data is available in all cloud environments. So it's um, again, going back to that kind of individual user circumstance. And um, we've had to be quite inventive with how we do that in a training environment because it can overwhelm people quite a lot. But I think if you can do this, it has the benefit of helping to create long-term vested users um, you know, which is great for us. We want to have our data used by as many people as possible, but also allows them to continue to do what they need to do to meet their objectives of their particular work environment. So, yeah, that's been our experience there. Awesome. Um, well, let's uh, now turn to a different uh, a question to the panel. Um, uh, the question here is what makes a capacity development successful and what are some of the common points of failure and how does Jupyter Notebook based training address those weaknesses or <laughs> how does it not? Um, so let me start on that question again with uh, Edward. Thank you, Ross. So for, for the capacity development training to be successful, one of the things is to identify key partners that you can actually work with them and also have a strategy uh, development with these key partners. Every partner has an area of interest that they would like to work with. So identifying these partners and working with them, building their capacity in the area that they are interested to work with will actually make it more successful. Because after that, it's not going to be a one-time 
build development that you've actually done with them. But after that, they'll keep using it in other areas. So trying to identify their key points of working is also much more important. And as, as we are training them also, the focus is not only for them to also, uh, for them to only use it, but to also try and train other people they are working with. If they try and train them, then the, the understanding of the system will also be, they will actually get the understanding of the system very well. So right now, Digital Light Africa is actually building the capacity, the, the capacity of their partners across Africa with the aim that after they actually get introduced to the platform and they start using it in the area that they are working with, whether in water monitoring, urbanization, forest monitoring, and any other area they are working with, then the next step is also train their members, their partners that they are working with within the countries they are. So that at the end of the day, it's not going to be focused on a, a small group of, only a small group of people, but also to focus on the large group of people. So that's what Digital Health Africa is currently doing. And as I'm saying, it's actually, we've actually seen some a great success in this, especially with our implementing partners, that right now they've also tried to transfer it to their partners that they are working with across the country. So uh, let me turn to our other panelists. Uh, would any of you like to chime in on on how Jupyter Notebooks might address some some weaknesses in in our training models? Um, I can suggest one thing that I find they've been quite useful for, and that is addressing uh, the fear that sometimes people have when it comes to things like computer programming. Um, this was my personal experience becoming a scientist. I didn't come from a particularly computer science rich background. And so the first time I started programming, it was quite intimidating. And um, I've seen this a lot with um, other people we've worked with. Um, you know, I'm from a marine background, so people who come to our training courses may have a marine biology background or um, something similar that's not necessarily a particularly computer science uh, supported discipline necessarily, although it's growing more and more all the time. And um, with the notebooks and with the supported services that we have now for hosting them, you can get people working very quickly. And the fact that they can see, okay, I can run code and I can get an output that I recognize as something that's useful for me is particularly powerful. And then once they're in, they're kind of hooked. And if you can write your notebooks in a way, and there are tools that exist that some of my colleagues have been using for this purpose, you can write your notebooks in such a way that um, you know they can be edited or you can set sort of tasks in them for people to do in, in a small scale. They're programming kind of before they really realize they're programming. So for people that don't have that experience already, this is a, a nice way for them to get into it without getting kind of overwhelmed and fearful about what they're doing. And I think that's that's particularly powerful. And then the other factor, as I think um, Matt was mentioning, or, you know, from his talk really showed is that things can be scalable. So we can bridge gaps from where people are to where they need to be quite quickly with these kind of tools. Yeah, great. And I, I, yeah, I go ahead, Sean. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ken. I was, I was definitely going to echo what uh, both Edward and Haley said. And I would say, too, there's, it's not a, a necessarily a heavy lift to get people up and running with Jupyter Notebook. It's, it's really the concepts behind programming itself. And that's really what we're trying to do through the, the carpentries is to really get the fundamentals of the programming. And I think the, the, you know, the starting small, you know, building out programs step by step and, and, and giving lots of support throughout that process. And, and I think that Develop does a really excellent job in terms of uh, in, trained instructors that have been through the uh, software carpentry training, as well as a, a, a host of helpers that are there in the background uh, to support any questions that people might have. But I think starting small and building a program step by step and 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 having that, you know, the realizations that, that Haley was saying that you can, you know, you can write a small program and you, you can have results uh, through Jupyter Notebook uh, relatively quickly and just getting those small wins and 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 basic, you know, training them on those those fundamental concepts and then, you know, kind of scaling up from there. I think that's a, a really excellent way for leveraging Jupyter Notebooks for, you know, training people how to use different programming languages. Very good. Um, Haley, let me direct a question to you that actually is uh, stepping a little bit outside of the um, capacity development domain. Um, so how can projects support co-development using uh, Jupyter Notebooks? And uh, how can CIOS be more inclusive in this area? And we'd like to start with you and then 
we can turn to any of our uh, panelists or our previous speakers. Yeah, I think co-development can be particularly powerful. I mean, um, this sort of co-working idea is something we've worked a lot on in capacity development and training over the last few years. You know, getting people to work together helps them to learn better. They learn from each other. They get more confidence through this. So um, I think moving into models where we co-develop notebooks is particularly powerful. One of the challenges there is either, uh, from my mind, is the back end of how you support that. I mean, we've developed co-working environments for writing and text and things like that. It's a little bit more complicated with code and it really leans, I think, you know, good co-development of notebooks leans more into um, maybe software development skills. That a lot of us in sort of the, from a science background don't necessarily have. So integrating some of that um, principle, and this talks, touches on what Sean's been saying really kind of in terms of programming principles, I think could be quite useful to embed that in how we do our capacity building. So, you know, showing people the basics of how you use Git or a little bit about coding standards and practices and how we use modules or, uh, you know, how we don't uh, duplicate things. Um, I think supporting that element within our capacity development and training would be quite uh, valuable. So would, let me just open up the floor. Would, would anybody else like to comment on that? Kenton, if I can support this uh, approach, I, I, I'm not one of the panelists, no, but uh, oh, <laughs> I, think <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, I think what is really key and uh, it maybe is hard to communicate to the, to the user. Uh, uh, for the capacity building, uh, I think the Jupyter today is a de facto standard, it's becoming a de facto standard because it's a nice interface uh, to that put together uh, uh, documentation, live coding, uh, and uh, uh, a large variety of capabilities. No? Uh, what Ailey was mentioning before, what is behind the service, what is behind the, the, uh, the user interface uh, uh, as another value. So when people refer to the scalability needed uh, to run uh, global applications, uh, probably is a wrong expectation of uh, implementing inside the Jupyter notebook this capability because the Jupyter notebook will just provide uh, an interface to trigger that process uh, at scale. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it, for the capacity building, uh, we have to start, uh, uh, the user have to start playing with the data. And uh, today is the val valuable uh, interface for, uh, for doing that. Uh, uh, having uh, or providing uh, training only on paper uh, doesn't help. Uh, providing uh, paper and also the environment to run the command, uh, I think this is adding the, the extra value. So you study and you apply the theory. This is what is offering. Very good. Anybody else want to chime in on, on that uh, question of, about co-development? With Jupyter Notebooks? So if, if no one else has anything on that question, um, I see that we're about five minutes before the end of our time. And so um, I'd like to open up the floor uh, really for more free discussion. Uh, everybody's been exposed to a lot over, over the past couple of hours. Uh, with regards to using Jupyter Notebooks to explore Earth observations and thinking about how Jupyter Notebooks can be useful for capacity development uh, with Earth observations. Um, it, it, does anybody have um, uh, any comments or, or questions they'd like to throw out to the group? This is uh, Brian. I noticed a question in the Q&A about schools and students at colleges having access to these resources. Um, there were several things that were mentioned today in the demonstrations that are open. 
free and open, all right, and easily available. Uh, some of the stuff that I showed in the Google environment and the CoLab environment, that can be used by anybody. So um, it's there's no question of cost there. Some of the others, um, the ones that are a bit more complex, it, there's going to be some costs associated with those, and it, it'll be harder to uh, use those as free resources. Were there any other uh, presenters today that pieces of your presentation or your material are open for students or um, educational purposes? I believe that was the case. Um, I, I would say is that this is something that we're currently looking into developing in the UK and it's one of the reasons why we wanted to do th these webinars to try to determine what people need and also between the panellists, what do we have in common, what resources can we share, what are the common skills that we should all be, be supporting. So, so at the moment, the resources that we are putting together are really end of project resources and um, software carpentry, basic training things. And the big question is, is what do we have in common? What can we share? And should we be looking at creating some sort of central CIOS registry of Jupyter Notebooks that we can make freely available and how, again, we tie that into the best practice work we're doing. What can I run on my Jasmine system that we can put over into CoLab? We've done some successful porting of that stuff. And um, what happens whenever we try to link some of these into data cubes? Is there an easy way? of doing that. Um, so, so I think that, that there's lots of potential areas to discuss. And I think we do need to be looking at some point at some sort of centralized resource to, to help people build those basic skills. Very good. Esther I, and Brian, I uh, actually concur that it's, um, there, there's, it's kind of, and this actually goes back to one thing Simona said, that Jupyter Notebooks is becoming a de facto standard. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it's important for all of us in the, the space agency community globally to, to look to how we can uh, connect uh, our resources uh, with uh, learners and even more, uh, um, e explorers, people that are interested in our data sets, especially our, our open data sets and, and how they, they can interact with them. Um, Esther, do, do you have any final comments before we wrap up? Um, there was just one other question that I saw in um, the Q&A that um, where someone was asking about gridded models and um, the answer to that is that yes, we do have a couple of different examples within NCO uh, where we're looking at fire, where we're using the Jules model and uh, uh, so it's fire in Hibawari, um, Jules model and easy MIP data and also looking at um, pest risk. So using biological models next to weather and satellite data. But um, I, I think we would need to have a specialist webinar to deal with that sort of material. So again, if anybody does have these specific requirements, fill in the survey would probably be my last comment. Very good. We would really welcome uh, all of the people that have participated in the, uh, uh, the webinar today to, to to take a look at the survey and give us uh, important that some of that important feedback. Uh, well, with that, uh, I want to sort of go in reverse order. Thank our panelists. Thank you for joining us today. We really uh, welcomed your comment and discussion. Thanks to our demonstrators and all of uh, the, the really cool <laughs> uh, notebooks uh, that you showed us, and and um, uh, thanks to this uh, this the 
the speakers, uh, myself and, and Yusuke. Um, I uh, really appreciate all of, all of your efforts and uh, to, to everyone that joined us on the webinar today, we really appreciate your attendance and your, your attention. We hope that you uh, found it as interesting as we do. Um, so with that, I, I think uh, we're able to conclude. Thanks so much to everyone. Thank you.